Hello, everyone, and this is another episode of the Feeding Curiosity Podcast. Again, I am joined by Joe and my brother, Nick. So, hey. take it away. Hello, hello. So, today, I'm on spring break right now, or at least it's toward the end of the week. Let's see, last week was my birthday, so I'm now 25. I'm a quarter of a century old, so that's a thing. Other than that, it's just okay. been work for the last seven days in a row. Tomorrow's eight. I'm really looking forward to the weekend. Anyone else? Goings on? Just uh, I St. Patty's Day is Saturday. We're going out. Nice. With the veteran guys? No. Uh, nice. That'll be fun. Yeah, we're starting at 8 a.m. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. I don't know. a bar crawl? Yeah, I guess so. All I know is that at 8 a.m., there's one place that serves the first 100 people to get in there get free breakfast. So we're going to try <laughs> It looks like you're getting breakfast. Hopefully. I'll probably not train first thing. I'll probably go to the gym after breakfast and, and meet back up with them or something. Yeah, that makes sense. So we will see. Nick, on your end, anything fun and exciting? Nah. <laughs> Just chilling. Just doing the huge. Trying to do homework and stuff. Yeah. You know. Oh, so things going on this week. I was able to stumble upon a podcast with Yuval Noah Harari. He is the author of Sapiens, I think, which he's most known for. And then and his newest book is called Homo Deus. I definitely actually had a chance to read either of his books yet, but I've heard so much about them that I feel like I have enough to know. He's also appeared in Tim Ferriss's newest book, Tribe of Mentors, as the last section of the entire book, which was a pretty cool capstone. But we actually listened to him on a podcast for Russell Brand. Is it uh, Under the Skin or Beneath the Skin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Under the Skin. So... If any, like, it's a preface in the bio in Tribe of Mentors that uh, Yuval doesn't show up in podcasts or is just notoriously hard to pin down. And for reference, I think he's a professor in Jerusalem. I feel like I'm wrong with that. From Israel. Yeah, he's from Israel. I know that much. But I wasn't sure if he was there or not. But in the podcast, it was really interesting to actually get his personal take on a lot of things because a lot of people talk about all of... His ideas. He's become part of the collective unconsciousness, I would call it. The zeitgeist? Yeah, a little bit. Like the uh, intellectual dark web group, almost, without being in the media. I, I don't know how much he's in. I don't know if I'd call him part of the intellectual dark web, because that's pretty specific to like a handful of people. All those guys know his work and quote it and reference it with some of their stuff. Yeah. So, that just... I thought it was an interesting podcast. I don't... I think he make some mistakes like his definition of humanism seems off yeah i thought the same thing i thought it was it seemed an interesting kind of like um not completely fleshed out like almost an oversimplification yeah, yeah and he said that it has to do with the importance of human emotion basically he, said, he summed like, it down to feelings being highly determinate and like are highly important and i was like that's not what humanism is humanism has to do with the individual humans ability to know truth rationalize you know figure things out basically isn't it like, isn't relying it, out like yeah like humanism is the belief that we can figure everything kind of that people can that they have the capability of doing so and it's a secular philosophy so it doesn't have any like <laughs> so a lot of <laughs> humanists definitely talk about religion but humanism isn't yeah that's what he said he said it was based off of religion Initially. Uh, Russell Brand mentions that, and I oh, okay. think he's right. And I think Russell Brand was right to challenge Yuval for some of his some of his statements. But basically, I don't think you can actually get humanism without a Christian theological underpinning. And part of the reason for that is just that there's implicit ideas within Christian Judeo Christian thought about the import or the ability of people to be able to know truth. And huh. that idea is what eventually turns into humanism. That makes sense. That's where Sam Harris goes wrong. Because Sam right, Harris yeah. is an old school rationalist and pure, well, probably more of an empiricist. So one um, of my the interesting parts of that with the whole part of Sam Harris where they got into determinism, whether or not we have, actually, I think this almost came up. I think it came up with Rogan too recently. But basically they were talking about whether or not your destiny is preordained, right? Like the choices you make. I feel like. Right. I don't, I don't know. Part of me. Yeah, it's. I would be careful with what you mean by by saying destiny because that has a uh, pretty strong connotation to it. So Harris would never say if somebody have a destiny. Right, yeah. That, 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 that there's determined, that things are determined. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. It's not the same thing. So like destiny replies, it's like 
chosen path where determination is something like because of the way things are situation, it's a simple cause and effect issue. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Like you just have all of these causes interacting and that the effect is as effects ought to be. And you're just mm. stuck in that position. That's interesting. I don't know. It's hard to say whether or not that actually free will. How do you? Yeah, that will? more of that free will side of things. Because like, be- I don't know if you can escape it exactly. So Harris, I should, we'll divorce ourselves from Sam Harris specifically. They're right. Yeah. Anyone that's a rationalist, whatever. Go off for this Newtonian idea. So I know Newton said something like, if you show me every particle in the universe, I'll tell you where the universe will go, mm-hmm. which is a determinant idea. Which is, it's something like, in a world determined, not a world determined, in a world that is constituted by a series of cause and effects, yep. then only the effects that, oh, I really don't know how to say this, I'm reaching past my, what I've thought about in the past. <laughs> <laughs> because we have these causes that exist now, only the effects that you would assume from those causes are likely to happen. Yes, I see that. Like that's a really bad definition, but right, yeah, you know, it's better and more in the future. That makes sense. What was the other idea is that you've all I specifically had his? He basically takes an evolutionary look at humanity and then tries to put a narrative to humanity as a whole, which I found interesting. Yeah, I think he had a lot of good stuff to say. Yeah, I, I think um, it's it's more of a looking at an introspective to see here's where we were, and then here's how we can adapt to the future of with all of this crazy technology and stuff like that so and the message i got yeah it's kind of interesting because he's like really close he's really close to this kind of meme or archetype idea because he puts so much importance on the concept of the stories that we tell ourselves yeah he, he definitely does yeah but he has this really strict very strict distinct definitions about this it's just there's these two distinct things there's the factual world what is that he calls real he calls that true and then he has the story world which he calls lies but that can be helpful but he doesn't explain why i missed that part (laughs) that are helpful or how they function if they are yeah he didn't he didn't give us specifics behind those stories so the idea would be that there are certain ideas that are adaptive functional stories Mm -hmm. that enable people to act in the world and survive and reproduce. He, Yuval doesn't touch on that. He wants to throw, it's almost like he wants to just say that all stories are lies in a sense. That's weird. For someone like him too, who's obviously religious in some level. No, Yuval I don't think is. Oh no? Uh, Russell Brand is. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was getting you some. I was getting a religious vibe somewhere. Yeah, he he totally yeah. said I was beyond the like. I'm so confused by him after because <laughs> I listened yeah, to the he, Jordan Peterson podcast with him, and then when he was on Rogan, I was like, wait, what? Who? I thought this guy was weirdo. He's, oh, I mean, he still is a weirdo, but like that's stupid. He's definitely all over the place. It's kind. He's kind of new age. I think he's very new age. Is a good way to think about it. He has a, how I say, it, like he's a Marxist, but he's also a union, which doesn't make sense because those two things don't quite work because you could say that Marxism is the least functional of ideas considering what happened. So it doesn't fit quite with the union framework that would say yeah. that ideas that allow you to reproduce and that are really to survive so that you can reproduce are the functional ideas that work. Those are the archetypes. Yeah. Okay. I see that. So, but you couldn't call Marxism or, yeah, you wouldn't call Marxism functional because when it's employed in the world, it causes the death of the people that are involved in it and others. And you can't reproduce if everybody's fucking dead. Yeah. If everyone, <laughs> I feel like that's a basic, under or should be a basic understanding for that framework. So I think he likes the symbology. Yeah, I, I could, I could believe with that after, especially listening to the Jordan Peterson episode he had where he really got into the mythological like framework of stories and narratives with him. Yeah. That was a confusingly cool podcast. Yeah, I know. They like really had a friendship toward the end, or at least it felt like it. Yeah, they, they, it went well. I was surprised. <laughs> I, I, I was pleasantly out. surprised on that one. I'm trying to think of any other recent podcasts that I found super interesting that have similar ideas. Close to those? That's hard. We could still, I'd still, I have more I could probably say in your balls. 
stances. Russell Brand's criticism that he was playing a sleight of hand, I think, was correct. Yeah, I caught that. I was like, that's interesting. It's almost, I'd have to re-listen to it a couple times to really get down what the argument he put toward it. So yeah, I'm because, he, like, I mean, it goes real fast. Like, they really... But it seems to me that he doesn't want to... He seems to be a diehard materialist. Okay, sense. yeah, I don't believe that. Darwinian. Almost a Darwinian, but he doesn't take the Darwinian notions into an ideological... And the Darwin side definitely makes sense if you're going to write books that are sapiens oh. and homo deus, like... <laughs> you don't yeah. get any more Darwinist than that. He's just evolving the method or the language or the definition to this newer version of it. You know? He's almost like an old school, like enlightenment person. I bet he's a big fan of Dawkins because he's he seems like that. But with Dawkins, Dawkins books, which honestly, I don't really like Dawkins that much to be. He feels dated now. Yeah, he does feel dated. That being said, his ideas are interesting. Lee, certainly a genius in his. Definitely. I'm not taking anything away from him because he, he, he helped people as a stepping stone to where we are today. Can't take anything yeah. from that point. I think it's actually think, right now is a good point to actually say uh, paying respects to Stephen Hawking, who recently oh. passed away. Speaking of great minds. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah, I know. I will was he? 70. Nick, you remember this, right? It was at 74? 74, I think. Yeah. Jesus. I mean, he was supposed to, his doctors gave him a diagnosis when he was 18 that said, he would be lucky to live two extra years or something like that. I forget. Yeah. It's, that's pretty crazy for someone who had, did he have ALS? I believe. So he was able to transcend a lot of things with, it's pretty crazy. And yeah, thank God he fucking genius. Another one of those guys. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. I'm trying to think of other stuff lately. It's been in the news. I'm avoiding the fucking news. The only way but, that I find out that even. I do Philly like DeFranco. That's my thing. Yeah. <laughs> I stay yeah, away from most of it. Unless it's on Rogan's, unless they talk about it stuff. Yeah, I'll peruse. Yeah. yeah. I have a handful of places that I'll go. It's usually because I'm not too interested in the specifics of it, if I'm being totally honest, mostly because I'm fucking exhausted and any major news. Well, it's all just yeah. garbage. Yeah, well. Like, it's just all of this useless noise. Someone's upset about another thing, or Trump said another stupid thing, or whatever. Like, it's all just dumb. It's Pablo. It's yeah. It's a fucking Pablo. I mean, so I just avoid it altogether. <laughs> what is and the 24-hour cycle? 1% of it is important. Yeah, and even when that 1% arrives, it's usually presented poorly. It's presented poorly and then out way sooner than it should be, probably. So I just focus on topics. So if I know I'm going to talk to gun control about somebody, I'll go and look up stuff about gun control. And I'd rather have form an opinion that I can... You actually save time, I think, to some degree. If you form your full opinion, different topic, then when you're presented with any new form that arrives in that topic, you already have an idea of what you're getting. Yeah, because you can't like even begin to understand something by looking at it like from a Facebook article because you don't know who that person's getting your source from. And 99% of the time, it's someone terrible like BuzzFeed. Yeah, and you almost can't take things case by case. To so How do I say this? That's not quite right. That's actually not. You want to take things case by case. But you don't want to have to reform your opinion every time you're presented with a new case. So what you do is you figure out all the basics and nuances and try to create a well-informed opinion about whatever issue. Mm -hmm. And then as a new case comes up, then you've already got a basic framework for how you're going to look at this. And then you either adjust your framework if new information comes in. Yep. Or... You just assimilate it in, which is a t which is actually this a type of you either accommodate or assimilate. So like in psych, it's your schema, which is like your framework for thought. Right. Yeah. Like when new information is presented, that's exactly what you do. It either like, works with the information you've already made, and you assimilate it, or you accommodate that information by changing your framework. Yeah, I think yeah, we just actually talked about this in my philosophy class itself too. It was like the concept of the default position, where sometimes it's to oh like. Your default position is to not have an opinion, but to be like, I don't know, just straight up, I haven't looked into it enough. Whereas I think a lot of people wind up just getting caught up in what's the thing in the news. Oh, this is the opinion that everybody else seems to be having, so this is what I'm going to jump onto, on board with. A lot of people do that. A lot of people just, um, and this probably coincides, but a lot of people just say what they feel about the issue and not what they actually think. So they'll just produce an emotional reaction and then say that, and it's not necessarily a thought out argument or a framework of how they think it's just a it's almost like a, a catharsis they're releasing their emotion they're venting yeah that makes sense which you saw not and that's not a downplay it's not like their emotions are unjustified a lot of the times they're very justified like righteous outrage 
at this recent school shooting is a perfect example. Right. But yeah. it's also not a solution. You know what I mean? No, yeah. I mean, so having that emotion is, is one thing. But... Mean, yeah, you can be angry, but that doesn't mean your anger has produced a viable solution to this problem. I think so. it's okay to be angry in the beginning. And then once you're less emotional and able to look at it from what's the real problem here is really important. Yeah. And you actually have to, like, you, if you are just angry, you're not going to come. That will cloud your judgment and there's no way you're going to come up with a positive solution. Absolutely. Because you're going to be leaning in a very specific direction. But maybe your balance is somewhere in be in somewhere behind the line that you're setting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because you get you yeah. stirred up into an emotional kind of like tornado. Yeah. For like and, and people term. do that in other situations too. If they're feeling down on their stuff, then they'll be like, Oh, I'm never gonna be able to do this. Right, do yeah. That. And maybe in reality, if they were being level headed, they would be able to accomplish the thing if they were that they're concerned about. It's just sometimes it gets in the way. It's a spiraling cycle. It feeds on itself and then it takes a mind of its own sometimes. Yeah, so it's complicated. But it's a, that's why I don't comment about politics on Facebook really anymore. <laughs> you stayed, you straight away, you've learned your lesson. Yeah. <laughs> I came all of this last time. I won't say who, just because. Yeah. I don't know if I was going to listen to this, but not that the person I think would mind, but I got asked about my opinion on the shooting and gun control is prefaced with, I know you don't comment about these things on Facebook. <laughs> <I'm>, yeah, <laughs> <more> learning. <laughs> yeah, because especially on Facebook, you wind up seeing this like, I, I, now that I understand more of a philosophical structure of an argument, it winds up being like almost a semantic disagreement where people like, it's something about the words they're using that they don't agree with where they actually, or they're just talking past each other where they're just taking facts from what they believe and just putting them out there. But the other person's not even going to pay attention at that point because they're just upset. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, there's a lot of the time you got to know the person that you're talking to is worth talking to. A lot too. of the time they're just not going to listen. They've yeah. already made up their mind. You're not going to convince someone who already knows everything. And that happens a lot, like a lot. Because a lot of people now, the, both the blessing and the curse of the internet is there's so many options of getting your information from anywhere and anywhere, everywhere and anywhere rather. And you don't know where they're getting their stuff. And for all they believe, they probably got it from someone they believe in or heard it from somebody. And then they just don't feel like the need that they can go further or need to go further. And then they're just, they're, they're locked in kind of. Yes, yeah, they they created their thing. their bubble. <laughs> they're, they're comfortable, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I need a really good example. Of this there's someone that I know that is a Christian religious fundamentalist and knows oh, that uh, I like okay. Jordan Peterson. Okay, and is only now being exposed to Jordan Peterson and doesn't any time I present the ideas, it's like a wall comes down. Like I just shut off. Oh. Goes after like doesn't even. Doesn't even believe in humanism, thinks that humanism is like the wrong direction, which is just god awful. Like, <laughs> that's it, but yeah. it's absolutely you. I can't even, it's frustrating me because you can't actually have any sort of discourse at all. So here's the problem, too. So if I was like, okay, let me tell you the perspective of this philosopher, he would be like, and let's say I said that, let's say, I'm like, here's Spinoza. Spinoza believes this. Yeah. He'd be like, Spinoza sounds, is he a humanist? And I'd be like, yes. And it's like, there's the wall. That's like, oh, because he's humanist. Oh, wow. So it's like, Ooh, if you cross that, that line in the sand, it's just immediate. Nope. I don't yeah. even want to hear it. And you <laughs> are, if the person talking is not also a religious fundamentalist, then there is no point in listening. That's, how does that happen? That, I, it's ideology. Yeah, that's crazy. And it's, I've been, okay, so that, here's the interesting thing too. So one of the, he sent me a really good kind of, so it was a good criticism of Jordan Peterson okay. from a Christian religious fundamentalist perspective. I assume fundamentalist. I don't, I'm not totally sure, but it sounds like it. I think you probably have to be to make this argument. Right. But it was a good criticism. Like it was well done. Except the person totally left out pragmatism. So it was like, and they made a scare or a, a straw man of his argument. Oh, wow. So they had to wipe away all the evolutionary speak just with the, the wave of a hand. I was like, oh, because you're a fundamentalist, you don't believe in evolution. Huh. That's weird. That's so strange because 
Peterson talks so highly of Christian religions that a fundamentalist would completely throw it out with the bathwater. So they, they kind of praised the person. And part of why I said it was a good article is because in the beginning, it was a lot of setting up the argument, setting it up as if it's not a straw man. But fundamentally, it ends up being one just because he leaves out so much. Okay. So he like said he presents a actually strong enough, but strong presentation of Peterson's views and then goes through them. And the basic criticism that the person had was that though he believed in these ideals, right? He wouldn't say something like revelation is true. Yeah. So it's looking at it from a secular perspective. And basically, in other words, it's a Christianity without a God in the sense that you would think of God traditionally being an infinite being. Right. With personality and all this, which is, I think, absurd because I don't, here's the reality. Like, here's the odd, like, bling to no bullshit truth. The, the God of fundamentalists that is this being that exists in the sky with personality is impossible, period. You can't be limitless and be embodied and personable because having a personality implies that you don't have all aspects of all personalities. Therefore, you're not infinite. Oh, that's a Who yeah. That person is defined also by what they are not. It's the God dilemma. There's like a, there's a, it's, <laughs> it's the omnipotence paradox. Yes, that's that one where it's like, if God is infinite, then he can create something that he can't do. But then if he creates that thing, then he's not an omnipotent God. Yeah. It's the stone <laughs> issue. It's, yeah, the stone. Okay. So can an omnipotent God create a stone that he can't lift? Yes. Okay, so if he can't create a stone that he can't lift, then he isn't all powerful. But if he creates a stone that he can't lift, he's now not all powerful. So, so the, the idea of <laughs> being as God, it just doesn't work. And it doesn't even work from a, like, a theological, a well thought out theological. I was going to say, is, is there any rebuttal to that design? Yes, there is. You do, you have a problem with the definition of God. Oh, okay. So, and it's not that it's a like God wouldn't be all powerful exactly. It would be that. God is all things, not just outside of them. So that if a stone... Okay, a stone, kind of looking at like almost like a Buddhist. Like a Buddhist God. God is similar. Yeah, not exactly, but that's the first thought that came to mind. It'd be all things that exist are a part of God. So in that huh, sense, that's you really can't interesting. actually have a... It's illogical for a stone that he can't live to exist because that stone would be a part of. Yeah, because then he is everything, so therefore... It doesn't matter whether what it actually is. Yeah, it's yeah, yes. And then the, the I mean, other... that's really close to what I was talking about earlier before we started about Berkeley and Your his paper. idea that there's a single yeah that there's a single infinite mind that exists. There is like, is that like the collective unconsciousness that term that's thrown around? Uh, okay, that so tangential. The, no, it's uh, they don't relate. So. Okay. The collective unconscious is a Jungian idea about a series of symbols and motifs that exist across humanity and are innate, meaning that they're biologically based. So that's what archetypes are. So oh, okay. these symbolic representations of ideas that are functional to use, and because they're functional, the circuitry that produces them in your brain has survived or because of those process right so now everyone can relate to a hero story because the archetypes the circuitry that produces the archetypes actually exists within your brain so it's physical huh. where and that's really it well is integral to understand archetypes and to understand the collective unconscious but the idea that berkeley had is a single infinite mind it's something separate that infinite mind thing is going to blow my mind he thought that all things were ideas because of and i can lay out the basic well that makes a lot of sense because if you think about it Everything we have, like everything that humanity has created started out as an idea that somebody had. For some reason, that person was like, I'm going to make that real. And then now we have it. Everything I mean, was a, a theory or a thought at some point. That's just without any philosophical thinking. It's just what I thought. But even with that, you can argue that there's a material world that exists that you overlay your ideas onto. And okay. Stuff in. Where you have a where you have a framework of which that thought fits into. You have a you have an intermediary place to transmit those ideas. Mm -hmm. So it's like you construct. Here's okay. So I'm going to touch on my paper, which is this is one of the objections that I had. Oh God, I don't. I might have to lay this all out before I hit the objection. To be honest. 
do, do yeah, do, do the Spark Notes version, or if you can. Yeah, I can do Spark Notes. Spark Notes. Berkeley is. He says, "Where do I start?" It? There's a whole lot that happened. <laughs> uh, so there's this idea of secondary quality. These are what you immediately perceive. That's something like red, right? So people that have car color blindness might see different shades of red. So what is red? It is the perception that you experience, right? Now you could define red as the wavelength that produces whatever color it is you're perceiving. Yeah. So the wavelength, that would be a primary quality. That exists outside of the mind traditionally. That's what Locke would say. Yeah, and that's what we use science to determine via measurement of right. sort. So that's what you would think of as a prime, that's what you think of matter is that. There's this mind-independent substance that produces our perception. Berkeley goes and takes a step farther and proves that uh, our rights and argument for primary qualities also being mind-dependent. So he uses size to demonstrate it. He says, let's look at this cup. Okay. From me standing close to this cup, it looks large. But if I step farther away, it looks a lot smaller. So the cup can't be both large and small at the same time. So largeness and smallness must be in the mind, depending on the mind. Now you could say, oh, just because your perspective changes doesn't mean that the cup doesn't have size in general, that it doesn't take up space regardless of where you're standing by. Yeah. Now the question is, how do you measure that space then? So let's say you want to measure it and you're like, oh, it's a foot. It's a really big cup. It's a, <laughs> it is a foot tall. How did a foot come into being? It came because of King Henry the, the first. So something relative created that measurement. So every time you try to measure something, the thing that you're using to measure it is reliant on something relative also. So how do you tell what takes up space if there's no way to tell what space is or how something. Yeah, that's really interesting because we, how many different space slash volume measurements do we have, right? If you think about it, like how many different units can we convert something into to define a space? So that video that I posted earlier today, which I'll have a link for in the description. It's, it's called the coastline paradox. So what ended up happening is when they were measuring coastlines, different institutions would come up with different measurements, like drastically different. Really? So for the same coastline. So they'd be like, what the fuck? What is going on? So what it turns out is the tool that you measure with determines the length of the coastline. Because yeah, if you do it weird. Because a coastline isn't straight. It is a straight line. It curves. Yes. So if you measure in miles, you're cutting off a lot of those curves. So if you're the smaller the measurement you use, the longer the length of the coastline is what happens. But oh, you can crazy. take that, you can take that ad infinitum all the way down to atomic levels and whatever, and it'll get longer and longer. Yes. So the question is, what you're seeing there is what Berkeley was talking about playing. And you're seeing it was just from my engineering background is you're seeing calculus applied via thought experiment almost because you, that's the, the idea of an infinitesimal where you're looking at something in smaller and smaller slices to get a more accurate representation of something that calculus usually looks at things changing over time, but it still works for distances too. So there's a rebuttal that comes up in his book that Berkeley presents to himself. It's what if we define that or that which produces our, it's the substratum beneath our perception. Each level, so if the thing you're perceiving has size, it takes up space. And whatever's beneath it, that substrate has to take up space in order for the thing above it to take up it's like bricks constructing a wall the gotcha. wall should have as much space as the bricks provide but then you could take it another level lower and another level so a second that you disprove that taking up space or a second that you prove that taking up space is relative each substratum falls with it like dominoes right yeah so everything is based off taking up space but if space is relative that all levels of this thing only take up space. So what he's saying is that because all things are relative, then all that's left is the ideas that we perceive, essentially. That ideas are like, not in quite the way we normally think of it. They're like the thing itself, whatever it is. Matter is out the window, but all the substrums and elements that we're perceiving all together to create the thing that's in front of you. And that's the idea. So that is super deep. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. I really like her. That's really interesting. The, th the funny thing to me is that modern day philosophers and all philosophers basically after Berkeley just go, eh, eh, so what? <laughs> <laughs> they just ignore it. 
<laughs> yeah, you have to all fucking ignore it because it doesn't. It's an idea, but does it have impact? I'm trying to think of way of like, that, dude. I asked the same thing in class, and my teacher thought it. I don't think she thought it was that funny, but I thought it was funny because I I was like, what does this matter? Yeah, like, that's exactly what I was thinking. So long, I, I said, so long as you can act in the world, what? Does it matter? And she goes, Oh, I guess we're done doing epistemology then. She's like, You just want to leave? <laughs> I'm like, Oh, <laughs> I, thought, I thought about that because that's a good point. Because then why do any philosophy, right? But philosophy is epistemology taken to the nth degree, basically. Uh, well, it's a seer, it's epistemology, ontology, metaphysics, phenomenology. Yeah. It's different forms of thought, but it's a lot of things smashed yeah. together. <laughs> I don't want to stick around for any of that kind of stuff, but I thought about it. It's it's because there's a dialectic that happens between our what our ontology or not maybe not our ontology, but yeah, you could say that. So our philosophy, speaking broadly, and how we see the world or what we can't know about the world, yep, plays off of it dances with how you act in the world. It informs it. It's like a corrective mechanism. <laughs> it's like science because science acts that way too. Yeah, so it's definitely. like there's a it's feed, like, there's basically a feedback loop. You're moving in a certain direction, and as you get more refined in your scientific findings, they course correct as you're moving. Yeah, definitely. So that's why you do those kind of philosophies. But I like Berkeley in particular. Oh, well, I just I don't know. I like it. It makes sense to me. It kind of reminds me of now that I'm 25 or whatever with the birthday thing. I was just kind of like thinking. I put a retrospective on like the trajectory of life, kind of introspection and kind of thinking like I've worked at the same place for four years now and then I've been to, at school for that entire duration as well and it's just and then we've got a new general basically having to explain who I am to this guy and then I realize you don't when you're in the middle of what you've been doing the last four or five years whatever you don't really realize what you've actually accomplished until you sit back and think about it and reflect and then I was just kind of like I kind of do know something when you have these ideas and you have these things like the person you were four years ago is definitely not the person you are today. Yeah. And in general, yes, you are. But like the opinions and, and, and thoughts and stuff I've been doing or even like the, I want to call it autonomy, but I wouldn't really call it autonomy. It's more of the trajectory of which I thought I was going to have is completely a curveball from where I would have expected to be. It's just an interesting thought. I don't know. Like I've run better. Yeah. Like I've, I also have run into issues where people try to ask me, it's like, where do you go? Like that, that whole, where's your five year plan kind of thing. And, and I don't. I can't give anyone a solid answer ever. Like, I don't know why, but it's just like a total thing where I'm just like, I don't, I refuse not to give an answer because I think that over visualizing where you expect yourself to be closes the door for where you close the door for things that are, appear along the path. It's almost, or you can let yourself down for like your expectation. Yeah. Like, or you let yourself down by not being where you were set, thought you were going to be when that time appears, because then you're, then you're, you're like, I should have been here by now, but now I'm not. So now I'm just going to start spiraling into this, like, how do I catch up mentality? Yeah. That's what bothers me about this whole, I see, I don't know how to explain it really. It's just like the traditional looking through school and the lenses of all that kind of stuff. It's just, I've always questioned it is the general answer to it. Question having a five-year plan at all? But yeah. I don't really ever have, I've never really thought of a five-year plan. I, have, I find I have like milestone events of, okay, school is the big goal. And then everything else between that goal and that is it's more of take it one day at a time. Yeah. I try to have a general aim. Yeah, I mean, it's yes. more of um. Go ahead. I'm trying. There, to... There's a. I think the mantra I live by that is. It's, I still think it's one of the best fucking lines ever. Like hands down, <laughs> it comes out of Ghost in the Shell, like the original one. Mm -hmm. And the AI is trying to convince the main character to combine consciousnesses so that you have a organic and a synthetic consciousness coming together. Yeah. And she, her reserve reservation is, how do I know that I'll still be me? That's a really good question. And he says, why would you want to be? All things change in a dynamic environment. Your desire to remain yourself is what limits you. And I was like, oh, I get it. That's really deep. It's evolutionary. It's what it yeah. is. It's the evolutionary process happening in a, in a microcosm of your own life. So yeah. that as you're moving, you're, you need to be able to adapt and reform to any new environment that comes your way. So it's a certain level of malleability being conservative with the overall structure. It's an interesting concept too, because innately most humans are, or I would say humanity as a species is wired in such a way that we, we 
instinctively push against change and especially radical change within our own what the environment is changing because before oh. we had to deal with seasons and just moving animals and stuff like that as a hunter gatherer where i think that it's going to get to the point where we actually just exponentially growing the only ever way we'll be able to keep up is integrating with a, a, a computer processor to be able to keep up it's going to be oh this is actually interesting i don't know if you saw it on the mixed mental arts facebook page but the guy put up Peter Diamandis had like predictions, like 50 predictions up until 2038. So he's like a futurist type dude and just put ballparking predictions of every couple years of things that are going to change. And one of the jobs that he put up there was it's going to become mandatory to have implants that help you do your job. So if you're like a stockbroker or some sort of like anal analyst, you'll have to have some sort of way to be able to manipulate numbers with computer parts basically embedded into your brain to be able to compute I, things at a high level, stuff like that. I wouldn't doubt it. And I know I, I don't I'm doubt it at all. I'm okay with it because I like the idea. Humanity is inevitably going to be obsolete when right. AI arrive. It, it's like, not a doubt. It's, it's a really interesting concept to think of. It, like technology is a way of forcing evolution without the constraints of biology is that time is, is that a good is that a good way of defining it uh, i would i don't know if i quite say without i don't know if biology is the right word i think time is yeah word. i guess it's it's circumventing because, the time element of evolution because right. it takes millions of years to for anything to evolve like even a little bit so it's like tech allows major adaptations to occur very short periods of time back to the retrospective that i had I really want to do a blog post about this, honestly. It's, it's looking at it from our lifetime. We're 25 years old right now. And in our lifetime, we've saw we've seen the advent of computers become things you use at school to being the size of a laptop, which I can't really think of a size comparison. I still remember floppy disks. So that, that should date us pretty well at the very end. And then we got to see the first laptops, the first smartphones with the Raz or the Razor and then the Blackberry oh. Palm Pilots. And then we got to see the iPhone and then like internet take off and play video games on the internet and take computers and go from giant monitors and heavy things that you barely ever got to use to carrying one in your pocket every day of your life. Dude, I remember when we got DSL internet in my house. Right. Was like I can play Xbox online. Yeah, I remember, yeah, Xbox Live, that's a really good point, because that was, like, one of the first, like, mainstream uses of the reason to have an internet connection. Dude, yeah, when we could play online, that was huge, because it was the LAN party. And, and then once Xbox Live went live, our like, connection across the country, we were able to talk to friends who moved away across the country. Like, we had a friend in Texas, and we would play video games with him and still was, like, stay friends with him and still are friends with him to this day because of being able to keep contact like that. I, I just think, like, the being able to look at it from our... Like, I think we have a really interesting window into the change of technology in the last 25 years because we've grown up in it. We're not young enough that we missed the, the gradual acceptance of it and are now in this weird realm of, like, where is it going from here? That's, that's all I can think about sometimes is just we're on the edge of something and it's not just one something it's like multiple breakthroughs at the i just feel like yeah. there's so much is going to happen in the next two to four years so i lost at south by southwest i know i saw the onion article that you shared or he I was on twitter today about something he was saying about internet is that what it was no the thing i'm thinking of specific i don't know if anything about that. but specifically you talked about how in any team months what are some major oh he, they'll have the ability to make all cars self-driving no way he said that 18 months he'll be ready yeah, it was like for 18 months. These are, we'll have the ability to make every single vehicle drive itself. That's crazy. Like we're at the point where the largest single employment category in North America, it's going to be wiped out in the next yeah. year. That's why I think that stuff like these podcasts and, and interviewing people who have been able to constantly learn and become a lifelong learner. I think that's why the, another reason why I think the university system is not so good sometimes because it forces people into a mindset where it's like, okay, you need to be in a standardized environment to be able to learn something. Like you need to be with a professor, or someone who knows something rather than having a question, looking it up online and then just diving, going down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Here's what I'd say. Yes, you can find any piece of information you want online. Right. Basically. No, it doesn't make up for the experience of the university. No. So I think the best thing that I've gotten out of being here, especially like I'll stick to the philosophy thing. Yeah. That's philosophy. your window of which you get to look through this. Yeah. Like our discussions at our classes are set up so that you in real time can debate, figure out, or encourage to object and then find okay. what's wrong with objections or just test I new ideas or test ideas against each other. And that is very different than just a one-way streaming dynamic. 
It's just not the same mm-hmm. thing. So if the internet is going to take over for universities, there needs to be a way that you can communicate better. And I'm not actually sure. I definitely agree. With- because we, just doing a podcast like this where we're streaming isn't the same as having one in person. I just actually listened to, so they had Daniele Boyle, Boyle and, and Rogan's podcast. He does another like a uh, history podcast, like uh, Dan Carlin. He's, all these communities are starting to overlap, which is, I think, amazing. The fact that we did a an interview with uh, Hunter oh, go. for this thing I- at this point. I would recommend you guys, if you guys want to listen to that one, it's episode 12, I believe, on BroPod podcast, which I think we did a really good one on that one. We, we Do you were have BroPod linked to our... Yeah, I can put it back up. I, I was messing around with stuff since we hadn't posted hope, anything. Um, I'm going to put up my philosophy papers on there. Yeah, we can re-upload stuff too if we wanted to from on the mine if we wanted to. Whatever. We should probably know convert these websites. Yeah, definitely. But we'll talk after. So yeah, that's a that's an offline conversation. But yeah, so he he talked with Rogan and Rogan was asking like, hey, since you're a professor and you're on the ground floor of this kind of information evolution, I would call it like our education evolution. He asked him, he's like, so is it does the internet like account for a degree? And he said it's emerging, and I think that's a really good distinction. It's he said yeah. it's, it's not there yet, but it's starting. It's going to take some company or someone with an idea to be able to transition it from. He said the problem is that universities have the monopoly on the on on the certificate program. That's the problem right now. Yeah, I and mean, it's one problem I'd say. Right. I think the other problem is you actually need birds to be able to be there and correct you yes. when you're wrong. I agree with that too. It's fucking easy online to hear an idea, think you understand, and then forward with the incorrect understanding. Absolutely. So I you think- have an extra there to, to put you on the right path. Yeah, I, I think one of the best parts to explain that too is I think with the whole advent of Instagram and, and the fitness movement of, of seeing someone who's an Instagram model type and posting workout videos and all that kind of stuff and, and watching those videos and then and thinking you know how to do that right without a coach being there and, and looking at your form and saying, hey, you're doing this wrong or that wrong or this. I think you need that secondary input to correct things because you can't look at yourself or be unbiased in the way you do something. Yeah. Just bring it back down from just an idea section of it there. It's one of the things I think about all the time. If we could have a universe that had a, I got how would you do it? It'd almost be like you need to have some sort of ability to have discussion groups with the professor. And in a way that works better than how we do it now when we're talking, we're talking over each other because you can't read social keys. You know what I'm thinking right now? What would be the next transition from that? If you want to leverage the power of the internet, you would have a virtual university, right? It would be VR implemented. So you go to class. You put your VR goggles on and then you're there in an avatar form. However, but the problem would be there is your AR or even AR. Yeah. Or even AR. You like you'd, you'd still go to a room, but that room would be an augmented room where the- you can have everybody else you're talking to in the class projected on the desk in front of you, like miniature. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. And you could like flick people across because if you don't like them, no. but no, like, I think that would be really cool to be able to have that where you'd be like, Hey, I'm going to do this workout session. And you have some ex- exercise physiology professor who's coached NFL athletes or something. And you could have him join your workout for half hour and he could coach you you know what i mean from across the world he sips coffee in his office or something can you think that'd be so freaking cool to be able to see the advent of this ar vr world of free information dispersal and i I think right now too looking at lives of people who've been able to adapt to this super fast space world is really important like the people who are like subject matter experts i would call them and being able to leverage what they've been able to figure out to be like either like for information purposes or just all the information you got to be able to pick and choose Choose the best parts and figure out what's best. Because now it's not, I don't even know. I feel like it's really hard to over-specialize with how fast everything changes. We're going to get to this point where, there's another thing that I thought about is I'm almost afraid that we're not afraid. I think it's inevitable to some degree. That we'll get to a point where any specific field is so dense that there's so much you have to know yeah. to catch up that you'll spend 40 years of your fucking life in school so that you can be on the same page as the people that are in the field. Especially if you're someone like me who's in tech, right? If you think of it right now, it's, it, it, what I'm learning right now is basically historical at this point. It's stuff that was used as the, the starting off point. And then I would need to go do somewhere that was at the cutting edge of research to be caught up. You know what I mean? Oh, here's another idea. So this is, I thought about writing a book about this, probably separate. From Instead of it getting to the point that I just mentioned, that instead it would get to the point where we have all of these things that we made that we no longer remember how they work and yes. we know how to utilize them. So it's like we have computer chips lying everywhere and nobody fucking knows how a computer chip works. And yeah. Nobody fucking knows how to make one. Nobody has a fucking clue. We know how to utilize it. And that's, right. that's a, it's so the same concept. In the future where we have all this technology 
that at the lowest levels that constitute that technology, that build that technology, we have no idea how it operates. It's totally forgotten. It was my thought. This is where the book idea was. It, I love that. You get to this point where, because nobody knows the lower levels, that if a catastrophe happens, if you have all this technology now, but nobody knows how to read it. It turns into that dystopian like look of the world where you have these things that are just rotten and just rusting away because no one remembers them. And this is, I, I can actually really talk about this because when I first got into electronics, starting at my community college, I really, I got into that idea. I still have all of the web pages I had saved. I went through and I was trying to figure out the simplest designs for everything. So like the first battery, the first everything, so that if something ever went wrong, I would know how to do it on my own. Fucking nuclear bomb went off. And we had no power, no anything. Would I be able to think a battery? I know, because only because I've learned it the last five years. I'm going to walk off into the force somewhere to die. Like I know. It's really scary, like, because that was my thought, is that the pe technological literacy of the average person is that they're scared of the technology we use, at least on a usable level. Does that make sense? Where, like, a lot of people are, like, they're afraid from from an ignorance perspective. So a lot of people are scared of how they work. But, like, if there's a problem, you have to go take it to somebody, and they mm -hmm. could tell you all these words about what's wrong with it, and they maybe understand 30% of what they said. Old people and computers. Exactly. That's the best way of putting it. But there's people now that are, like, our age who don't don't even know that like cars the analogy of people not understanding how their car works they just take it to the shop and they get it fixed and then they pay extra money because they don't know anything because yeah. they they had to fix extra things and they take more time i guess that's a different topic but it's all in the same lines because our tech our cars are becoming so technologically advanced I, f I remember when i first started harper cars were the number one user of computer components that was years ago and i can only imagine where they're at now considering all the autonomous stuff that goes into them yeah it's just to me i, I almost want to like make it mandatory for people to, or if I had the choice, I would make it mandatory for people to understand basic elements of how technology works, just from a historical perspective, to remember where we came from. Because I'd hate to go back to pre-lighting days, and that was only 100 yeah. years ago. There's a crazy idea for another book that I'm probably right now. <laughs> Man, dude, you're just full of books right now. Yeah, I keep playing with ideas and then just never doing anything about them. I feel like that's a lot of people, though, and I, I, it's almost a symptom of a writer. It's just a matter of when you hit that point where that idea stays in your head and the only way that it, it's going to come out of you, like it keeps you up at night, and then the only thing you can do to get rid of it is by taking it out and putting it on something, into something. Craig Ferguson talked about this, the comedian, but he mentioned how a some author came up to him and was like, oh, I heard you're writing a new book. And he goes, yeah, it's okay. I'm not writing one either. Like... <laughs> Everybody, every writer sits down and they look at the page and go, oh, fuck. I don't know. Anyway, I digress. So the other idea I had was like, what if places like ancient Egypt and all of them had gotten to the point that we are now? They actually developed to that point. Mm -hmm. But that information, because we weren't globally connected, that that information yeah. that collapsed was forgotten across the world. But also that because there's so much time in between then and now that the technology that they produced, since it wasn't made out of fucking stone. Because just, stone wears away. Stone. Left. stone lasts. It's metal that doesn't fucking do it. So if you're making circuitry things, that's going to disappear long before. Oh, definitely. When they get close. So it's like. It's going to run. It's going to corrode. It's going to break. They have theories that uh, the Romans had made computers. Yeah, they have, like, the first calculator is a Roman. It's all made out of years. You can look it up on, I think it's a Nova PBS special where they basically had this, it looks like a gear, but they, like, were able to do different scans on it and stuff and figure out what it was. And it's really interesting to see that kind of stuff. And going back to that Roman stuff is, for me, it's thinking about the Library of Alexandria. Because, like, they said it, when that burned down, we've lost the thousands of years of accumulated knowledge. And we, I think we take it for granted right now with how much information we get from written form like to, to think books have always been expensive and to have a copy of a book back then they were like i'm papyrus scrolls and things like that and to now that you can buy a book from amazon and have it in two days and it costs you 15 dollars for an average book i would call it yeah we just got wiped off the fucking map in 2000 years from now nobody would fucking know that we had Shit. Yes, it'd be, it'd be really, you'd be really hard pressed to find anything. There was a, there was like a series on Discovery Channel. It's like, what, ha what if humans? I forget. It was like, what if humans like just disappeared off the earth, and then they would, they did like a time lapse of this is one week later, four weeks later, one month later, two months later, and then it just keeps going, and it shows a time lapse of the trees and everything taking over the major cities of New York, L.A., and stuff like that. And it, it, it's scary at how fast it nature comes back because we yeah. really, we've really pushed and hold nature at bay really without really realizing how much we do active constant non-stop act attempts to mitigate nature spreading 
Yeah. Like, nonstop. Just think about it if you don't fucking mow your lawn. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in like a week or two, it's already already pretty tall. I mean, it seems like driving through the country, it seems like barns are broken down and mm-hmm. collapsed on themselves. And there's just, there's cover. I think one of the best examples too, especially if you live where we do in the Midwest near Chicago, potholes. Like, that is such a simple interaction it's just freezing thawing repeatedly and it makes giant holes like that that is such a simple interaction but it causes so much damage to the roadways and things and, and almost anything anything that cycles temperature is just crazy it's just crazy how much we have to put in effort into to make it i guess functional i don't know it, it's crazy to go obviously this conversation has bounced around every freaking direction right now but it's interesting to say the least at how much and we keep rushing back our timeline Humanity. I know, isn't that weird? As we keep off of finding new shit. The assumptions that we've made and like uh, Graham Hancock to go back to the ancient Egypt stuff have realized that the Sphinx might be way older than it actually is due to weathering patterns and stuff like that. I wouldn't surprise me either. Those monuments, how big they freaking are, those don't get, those are totally different time scales of projects. They don't get built in a decade. They get yeah. built in centuries probably because yeah. just how massive they are. What was it? It's like ancient Egypt is as close to the Romans as we are to them in time. Can you imagine? They thought that the, they were ancient. Like, we're right. always studying the Egyptians like we study the Romans. Like Exactly. That's Jesus. just totally crazy. And it's even more crazy that we remember people who are from those time periods, right? Yeah. Like, specific <laughs> humans that lived multiple thousands of years ago. Like, Marcus Aurelius, Julius Caesar. It's- and you go back, King Tut. Right. And then even yeah, further to the Egyptians, and then even maybe even further with the Mongols, and, like, some of the first kings ever, and, like... The- <laughs> Celeb- no, I think they're about the same time as the Egyptians, right? No, they were only like a thousand years ago. They were way. Oh, really? Wow. They showed up after Islam came into Egypt. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Like, just the memory of the human, human race is pretty insane to think about that. And there was once a time where it was before even that existed. I was in England at the British Museum. There was a stone tablet from the city of Ur, which predates Mesopotamia. Wait, it predates Mesopotamia? Yup. That is... Doesn't make any sense. It's so crazy. So yeah, I feel like I, I feel like we could totally have oh, another in podcast. Mesopotamia. Excuse me. I feel like we could totally have another podcast talking about ancient history and then another one on future technology. Probably. <laughs> in, in I don't know if I know enough about ancient history. No, but just like general ideas. It just wouldn't surprise me if if it turns out that this cycle of human advancement development hasn't happened again and again yeah i feel like it's you know like that what is it called that like civilization scale where it's like either civilizations get past a certain point the great filter there we go that's the word so it's like maybe humanity has gotten to that filter point and failed multiple times but we didn't make these computers and stuff before and now maybe it's here's what it will look like is that there are different filtering points right and each time you hit a filter it doesn't totally decimate everything it just decimates most of everything. So what you end up retaining is the cultural, evolved cultural framework to some degree that existed before the catastrophe and then carry it on to develop past it until you hit another catastrophe and then the cycle repeats. So each time it's okay, maybe the Egyptians got to the point where they can learn a battery and right. then something happens and the Egyptians fall away. Okay, so be it. Be far. They got yeah. pretty far and maybe the next civilization immediately after the Egyptians doesn't make batteries right away. But over time, they're not starting from square one each time. They're not starting from square one. So you keep having these cycles of growth, catastrophe, but not all the way back down to square one. So you grow back up, catastrophe, grow back up, catastrophe. Each time you get a little bit of growth every time, just a right. little bit. And you can correct for your mistakes. You can correct for your mistakes. It's so you can ask that if that same catastrophe happens again, you've already prepared for it. Because it's like, learned from it. it's, we're almost at that point where it's like, we're due for the catastrophe, right? This year, I think we might be, could be. Either at that point or we're close to the point, more. right? Yeah, like. We were, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Hovering over the buttons. Yeah. We learned enough from the last catastrophe not to hit the fucking button this time. Yeah. That could be bullshit entirely. It could totally be cool. We're just playing with ideas here, which is half the fun. But it kind of makes sense because there's a reason why it seems like we're on the forefront of everything because it's we've forgotten everything before us except for what we were able to decode. It's almost fun sometimes to think about if some ancient human finds a computer or an iPhone hundreds of years from now, how, what would they think about it? I don't think, here's what I think survives. I think ideas survive. So when the technology is destroyed, 
the ideological framework that provides the thought processes that would produce that technology that enables that technology to be built is what makes it past the catastrophe. So what we actually learn is how better to think, and then that takes us farther. Yeah, I, I think almost it's, it's actually good that the physical representation of the technology goes away because I think it frees up new avenues of implementation, I guess was the word. Yeah, it, it allows us not to caught up. Because yeah, once you have an idea of something, you, it's like the, when you see a table and you know what a table is, and you assume it has four legs and a flat surface and a whatever, like it's hard for you to like imagine a different kind of table or like yeah. a segmented table that's got multiple levels on it or things you could slide out or whatever. Like it's hard for you to- The destruction allows you the chance to free yourself from preconceived notion and then you can move freely again. Which I think that is, is a learn, I feel like a skill that needs to be learned now more off, more actively than ever before. Yeah. My fear is that <laughs> we've gotten to a point where everything is developed and is so tech seems to develop in the same way that arguments are formed, that their state is. And the later developments rely on the earliest. So in an argument, it's premises to conclusions. Mm -hmm. So one premise is preceded by another one, preceded by another one. And then you're preceded by axioms, right? So things that you rely on to be cornerstones, basically. It's like a foundation yeah. of a cornerstone. And in tech, it's like you have certain axioms that are initial ideas about what you can do. And then those allow you to create something. And then that creation adds a new platform and it's almost like a base for a stage. And then you can build off oh. of that. So like stories in a building where he has a floor, but you build off each level. There's actually something that goes off of that too, is that now with the, this new technology age of the Googles and the, and the Facebooks and stuff like that, everyone says, who's going to be the next Google? I remember reading this article, but it said, he said, it's not about who's going to be the next Google. It's that the companies that are going to come after those companies are going to be completely different came before it. It's going to be something that's just realized that it had a need for and it creates its own niche, basically. It's going to be something completely out of left field that somehow fits into the grand scheme of what it pushes something forward. It's got to be AI tech. Oh yeah, it'll be something along those lines. Either AI or some sort of automation type robotics. Unlike the software yeah. level, you know what I mean? Where it's not, it's hardware. Yeah, like implement automated. AI where it's like a process manager or something that can control a factory. There's no way that it's like artificial, like no shit artificial intelligence. I think another, another breakthrough is going to be within neuroscience and what's called brain machine interfaces, BMIs, where implement, implement implantable technologies into the brain or onto the body in some way that enhances human abilities. So here's what I'd say. I'm not fucking volunteering for the- Well, we're already doing it. It's that. crazy. I'm actually reading about it. So of course, Elon Musk has his own company that's starting this kind of technology called Neuralink. And so I'm reading a, a blog post about the company and where the technology is right now. And so I was just reading about the cochlear implants for hearing aids, basically. Mm -hmm. And they had a really cool YouTube video where they hear what a person who has a hearing aid hears. And the problem is right now is that our technology is very crude, but workable. The compensating for what the brain does, like for me and you to hear this conversation, it's 36,000 neurons. I think I'm butchering that number, but the- I'm sorry. Like, you can't make one fucking <laughs> antidepressant medication that also might make you want to kill yourself. You can't even figure that out. You can't even figure out something you can ingest, let alone connect to the brain. We make it work, but the funny thing is that the, like, the hearing aids we use right now have the equivalent of, I think it's one thirty-sixth of that, like, throughput. So the quality of the data, the fidelity of it, you can tell it's not real, basically. It sounds robotic because it's not able to mimic it completely, but it's still better than nothing. But it's just crazy to think that we're at this point right now where the technologies we were, we're going to start developing are going to be leaps and bounds ahead of that once we start figuring it out to a greater degree. It's just crazy. It's just so crazy. There's so many forefronts right now that we're at, you know, going to Mars, implanting shit into our brains or AI. I think we had a little bit of, this is what annoys me about the world right now. There's so much fucking opportunity and potential and everybody is so pessimistic. It's not only like, that too, it's that everyone's pessimistic and everyone is so caught up into Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And when you see these companies and the founders of those companies are like, oh shit this thing we made is way too addicting and they're starting to back out of it and not yeah. use it as much. That's what scares me. When now the algorithms are so smart that it like knows 
what you've been looking at and it feeds you more of that or when you're like i'm like talking like i'm guaranteed you some of the stuff i've been talking about like different books for people i'm gonna go onto my google ads and it's gonna pop up different books from those people probably say people yeah. and shit like that because it's always listening to you it's always gathering data and it's like listening to what you want it's like hey here's this thing you wanted it's just crazy and that's the root most rudimentary ai we have and ever will have from this point forward yeah brett weinstein made a good point about how markets don't do what we want them to do in this technological world social media and whatnot because what they end up producing isn't a better means to communicate they end up producing a addicting product yes that's it no longer become what they end up producing isn't a social yeah because they've already done studies on like the, the dopamine rush of getting a of a notification and likes and stuff like that yeah thing is i just i don't know so uh, you wouldn't say to fix that problem you would give social networks to the government because that's a fucking bad idea no, that sounds like a terrible idea because they're just going to use that information to become a uh surveillance network yeah we already have legal legal precedence set yeah. in the Patriot Act to where they can they do can that. just look up everything you fucking do. And if they have unlimited access to your social network, like your phone. So yes. you don't want to give it to the government, but you don't really want to let the markets run their course. So what do you do? Regulate them? How do you regulate them? You tell them what? Don't make your social network addicting? But they don't okay. even know how that works. End up just either over or under regulating or regulating the wrong thing and throwing the whole book off. You want to do that? I don't know. I feel like it's almost down to the, it would probably be because the, the libertarian side of it is down to the person to be, understand, hey, here are the negatives of these things, right? And then putting in tools that you can then self-mitigate the effects or I guess. I'm trying to- What you really need? I'm trying to, I don't know. It is a morally complex, sophisticated group of people that are constructing me. Yes, because if Twitter, Facebook, and whatever else were actually just run by people who gave a shit, then this wouldn't be an issue. Yeah, instead so, of just looking at it as a product to make money. To make Jordan Peterson's point is we need a moral, we need a moral framework that's as sophisticated as our technological one. We just don't fucking have it. I feel like that's interesting because I feel like with part of that, the morality of things has fallen to the wayside with the ever marching forward of, let's see, of making more oh, money. Modernism. Yeah, like modernism and just like the, the corporate machines, you know, how these mega corporations are now the new governments of the world for the most, because they're all yeah, laundering they, money across the globe to make them more secure. They can act like pseudo governments that exist yeah. naturally in some sense. Yeah, because especially with the whole banking system, when we had to bail them out when they're the ones that fucked up because we couldn't let them fail because- That was the biggest fucking mistake. I don't know. Let like capitalism run its course. Too big will automatically fail because it'll be too unruly to manage. Exactly. Unless theoretically in the future, you create AI that are sophisticated, which is a scary potential. But that's even more scary if you think about it, because what if they, the question is, do they then think we're obsolete and then course correct and say humanity is the cause of all the problems? Yeah. So one thing that you've all, I think you mentioned it was that we're going to create AI that'll replace God in some sense. But I can see that. Is, we might end up something he didn't quite nail is that we might end up making an unethical God. Huh. And that's not something. You yeah, I, I guess that's a good point because we don't understand, to put it in an engineering term, the coding of emotion, the coding of the the, the skills and, and thoughts of, of a human being to put that moral framework. Because because if- so it, what you want to do because, okay, here's another way that it, an AI can operate like an argument too. It will naturally. Arguments I think are, are something that we, their impressions, there's something we witnessed before we articulated them. So they happen in our behavior. You operate on certain axioms, certain fundamental beliefs, and then you build off of that. So if we code into our AI incorrect axioms, then the premises that will follow, even rationally, won't be ones that we fucking right. So you have to have serious, seriously strong, universal, ethical axiom encoded into our AI so that as they Ooh. grow more complex, they don't manifest dangerous conclusions. That's scary and trippy all at the same time. We're fucked otherwise because mm -hmm. it will we'll be taken out by something we never thought, we never intended. I mean, That's the whole pragmatic idea. The whole pragmatic idea was that the only way to test to know whether or not your philosophy is a true philosophy is to test it in the world. And that's yep. how you know it's true or not. So you test Marxism against the world 
and millions of people die. Okay, so something's fucking wrong with Marxism, even if it sounds good on paper. Because the holes, it's here's a really good analogy. All right, so it's like coding a game. Yes. So when you're all the coders, you're all the creators, you're the engineers, whatever. It's your world. You're making it. And you, okay, I think we're ready to put it up for beta or yeah. play testing. And you send it out to a million different people to let them play, and they will break that game fucking six ways from Sunday. Mm -hmm. Like you are going to see every problem that you never could see when you were making it yourself. You're testing it against the world to see what the problems are. It's like, a really good point too. We need to beta, like the, the going, like circling back around to the social media stuff is like we're experimenting with social media on humanity, period. Not in a beta test. It is the real test. It's a real time test of seeing what will this do to everybody. And it's really scary to think AI about that. That would test it against the world doesn't have holes in its premises so wide that people end up dying. Yes. I feel like I'm going to have a panic attack. I'm going to go, I'm going to go watch Black Mirror now and be terrified about the future of the world. I feel like watching Black Mirror after this <laughs> is not a solution. No, it's, I don't know, man, we're strange times to say the least and at the same time though it can be easy to be pessimistic about it but i'm more excited about the directions than anything else especially when we have people like elon musk and in, in the world who are trying to do good things and, and it seems like even jeff bezos the head of amazon is actually doing some better things too besides just being the richest man in the world so long as what it looks to me is that if you can create an artificial intelligence its prime axioms are universal ethical truths then you incorporate in a certain ability to adapt and recognize faults mm -hmm. and change premises and change coding based on new experiences that in order to better accommodate the axioms you've already set, then you can have an AI that might succeed. Yeah, accurate, completely accurate. I think that's probably a really good place to wrap up. We started with Yuval and bounced around in every direction after that. Yeah, a little bit. But it was actually a lot of fun. Because we really, we got into it. With that, everybody, that's going to do it for this episode of the podcast. I hope you all enjoyed it. Because I did. I love these conversations. I could do it every day. So, just some little update of stuff and things. I'm actually going to try and start reaching out, especially over the summer, of actual interviewees of other people in, these, in the local community where I live. People who I think are important to talk to and things like that. Or people who have impacted my life. And then just have questions out for those people. And then I'm going to start doing others. I'm thinking about doing a YouTube channel about more targeted information about just curious things and topics that we're finding interesting as a group and in my friend circle and stuff like that, which I think is also important to just keep more information out there for breaking down the echo chambers of the internet in some ways. So there's lots of angles we can take on this, but that's where I think I want to head for the time being, but this is a never ending evolving project and we'll see where it goes. So with that, everybody, we'll see you all next time.